Yeah, thanks a lot for uh, uh, joining uh, uh, my talk. Uh, so I'm a mostly like a computational uh, material scientist, and then now I'm a first year assistant professor at uh, uh, Florida State University uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. So uh, uh, today I, I just would like to share with you some of my uh, computational understanding of how to make use of a special class of materials, which is called high entropy materials into design uh, next generation batteries. Okay, so uh, let me start with a brief introduction, just in case uh, some of you guys are not uh, so familiar with what is going on uh, recently in battery field. So if you take a look at all those commercialized batteries, uh, particularly cathode materials in your cell phones, uh, your laptops and electric vehicles, uh, it's kind of funny, like uh, they have been uh, developed for uh, several decades, but they are still using pretty much like three to four metals. Uh, it's pretty much like lithium cobalt oxide, uh, lithium nickel cobalt manganese oxide, which we we'll call them NMC, or in, in Tesla, we're using NCA material. So all of them actually go with only three to four metals, and they take the same structure, which is called the layered oxide structure, when you have this alternation of lithium layer and transition metal layer. So it's kind of funny, like uh, there are so many people working on battery materials, but we realize that only three to four metals can work as uh, uh, active uh, cathode material. So we, we, we joke it as something called the NMC curse. And NMC stands for nickel, manganese, and cobalt, which are the three main metals that we can put into a battery. And the reason behind it is because when you remove lithium, when you use the battery, and you're going to leave an empty lithium layer, hopefully, and uh, there will be a tendency that uh, the transition metal from the metal layer is going to migrate uh, from the octahedral site, uh, going through this tetrahedral interstitial and goes to the lithium layer. This kind of a migration is actually detrimental. Like, first of all, you're going to block lithium diffusion in the lithium layer. Second, because transition metal are typically smaller, you're going to shrink the height of the lithium layer. In that case, lithium will diffuse much slower. So naturally, a good metal should uh, prevent this transition metal migration. And uh, chemistry is going to tell you how to do that. So it's pretty much related to uh, you know, the transition metal electronic structures. When you have octahedral coordination, you have two E orbitals about three uh, T2G orbitals. Uh, on the other hand, when you have tetrahedral, it kind of reverses. it. So naturally, we, we need a metal that favors octahedral and disfavors tetrahedral. And the trick here is just to put three or six electrons to occupy all the T2G states. And then we can use this chemical principle to select metals. Here I just gave example of all these uh, 3D transition metals. And obviously like titanium, vanadium, chromium are bad choices because when they get oxidized, they have less than three electrons and which they're gonna migrate. Manganese two plus and nine and three plus have the same issue that they have high spin states with all the D orbitals occupied and they're gonna go everywhere. So manganese three plus and ion four plus does not have this kind of issue, but unfortunately they are young tether ions. So if you make a compound on it, there will be a structural distortion, which is also unfavorable as a cathode material. So eventually what we have is manganese four plus, which is actually redox inactive. So if we need a redox action, you only have cobalt and nickel as the choices. So this is actually the chemical origin of this so-called NMC curse that most of the battery in this field use only cobalt and nickel, particularly for this layered cathode. So this actually raises up a huge supply chain issues. If you ever pay attention to critical materials, people always are uh, getting nervous about, you know, we, we soon gonna running out of this supply of cobalt and nickel, particularly considering we have more and more electric vehicles nowadays. So this is some of these mineral issues that we have so far, like 60% of the cobalt actually coming from one single country in Africa, which is called the Democratic, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. There are all sorts of issues of mining cobalt. And also another interesting fact is like 98% of this cobalt production is actually a byproduct of other minerals. So if we have a huge electric vehicle, if we really replace all the gasoline vehicles, I mean, this cobalt will very soon become inefficient. So if you pay attention to industry like Tesla, like they are starting to moving from cobalt-based battery materials into nickel-based battery materials. 
because nickel have a slightly better situations compared with cobalt. However, if you take a, like, take a look at the price of different metals, you will realize actually nickel is not definitely not the ultimate choice because nickel is almost the second most expensive metal just right behind cobalt. So naturally we need something else, right? So we are material scientists. We just want to free the periodic table and the secret behind it is disordering. So the disordering we can introduce here is like, uh, we can mix lithium with transition metals by doing synthesis control. And in that case, we lose this layered topology. And in that case, we don't need to worry about transition metal migration. There's no lithium layer for you to block. And in that case, lithium diffusion will only be related with the local structures, which we call them zero TM unit. And lithium can diffuse really fast according to DFT calculations. And that can enable fast diffusion in this disordered form of materials, which we call them disorder rock salts. So this is the beginning of our story. So now, um, I mean, my postal advisor and also including me are trying to push our limits to commercialize these materials because we essentially can free uh, the periodic table by using all the other metals, which hopefully will be more accessible and cheaper compared with cobalt and nickel. However, such materials have a lot of uh, puzzles, you know, like uh, hopefully we can use manganese, just give a manganese as an example, but if you make these two materials, they look pretty much the same. You know, they have the same amount of lithium, which means you have the same uh, theoretic capacity. Also, they have the same radial center, which is manganese surplus. And the only difference is that they have a different inert metals. So we put inert metal just to charge compensate in the chemical formula. However, if you make them into batteries, um, very strange thing happens. You know, the capacity, which is X axis, of these materials differs by several times. We should ring the bells, you know, fundamentally these two materials are different. If you do something like XRD to see the crystal structure, the bulk structure are actually almost the same. You know, they have the same XRD diffraction patterns. But if you do something like the electron diffraction, they start to show very different subtle features. The diffusive scattering features are totally different. Those features are something called a chemical short range order. So it's essentially a measurement of the power probabilities of certain species in these random lattices. And it can be calculated very easily by calculating the probability of finding B polling with A divided by the concentration of B. So if you get zero, it's fully random, it's random limit. But if you get non-zero value, it means you have chemical short range order. So you can easily implement this into a Fourier transformation and the intensity you get from this Fourier transformation is basically takes the Patterson function form. It's essentially the analytic form of this diffusive scattering features you see in experiment, which here I show like a diffusive uh, rings of uh, features. So this is actually the key to our disordered materials. It has been observed actually a long time ago, dating back to 1950s in metal alloys. But until 2018, when I started my research on this field, you know, we realized this short range order is actually kind of confusing. I mean, you cannot simulate it in a typical way. So this is like a, a casual simulation that I showed you like on the right-hand side is a simulation of electron diffraction by just randomly place cations into this disorder oxal lattices. I mean, as you can compile here, this does not really look that similar with experiments. And the most important thing is like you lose the symmetry information. You see a ring on in experiment, but we will barely see any symmetry in the simulation. So this is actually the computation challenging. How do we simulate a closer images as with respect to the experimental observations? So if you take a step backwards and take a look at what we're simulating here. So in experiment, when we do this electron diffraction, so my, uh, we, we have a micrometer size probe. So ideally we have a large ensemble of micrometer size of atomic structures. And typically when we do uh, electronic structure calculations, we have this DFT level of theory, which is quite limited into uh, the Armstrong scale or up to a few nanometers. So ideally, in order to simulate this electron diffraction, we need like billions of atoms, which in the micrometer size, 
And naturally, we need efficient Hamiltonian for you know, estimating this configuration of energy. So the physical model we use here is called a class expansion. It's the basic mean field approximation of the disorder lattices by um, uh, estimating as a linear summation of the different clusters in these lattices. So it's essentially a linear model, but it can be a really large linear model. So essentially it's gonna bring you like uh, thousands and even 10,000 of features if you're looking at a really complex system. So such kind of a nature of this model kind of limits the state of art research on only in binary and ternary solid solution problems. So this is which, which uh, this is actually the limit we're trying to push here. So we're trying to really push our limit to the dimensionality of this compositional space of materials. And this is basically a, a demonstration of this code infrastructure we're developing here. So I, I don't want to go too much of these technical details, but just to I'll give you a flavor of what has been done here. So it's basically a machine learning problem, which is pretty much like a compressive sensing of these important features, which all of them actually have some sort of a physical intuitions. So we develop a different kind of uh, regularization and group-based regularization methods to decorate the features and trying to reduce down these features into a reasonable amount of uh, a, a number. And also we're trying to apply some kind of active learning techniques to select the right sample, which gives us fast convergency when we enumerate different orderings. And we're also trying to automate it so that all the jobs like thousands of DFD calculations can be run smoothly on a good platform like NERSC. So this is pretty much what we developed in these code infrastructures. So let me just show you how useful this code can be. So let me just go back to this uh, electron diffraction. This is not so good refinement. This is what we get after we implement this class expansion tools and trying to simulate the electron diffraction. So now we not only get a closer image with respect to the experiment, but we are also recovering the right symmetries simply because we now have the right statistics with a large enough atomic model. So I just give a snapshot of part of this atomic model here. And because of this model, we know the real arrangement of atoms in the disorder lattices. And with this kind of atomic arrangement, now we can quantify our properties. If you remember, I mentioned that in these materials, lithium diffusion is only related with local structures, which we call the zero TM channel. So this is a local structure with only lithium in the corner of this tetrahedral. And what do we want to do to make sure we have good lithium diffusion? It's essentially that we need a lot of these local structures and we want them to percolate as a network. So this is essentially the analysis we need, right? So we can generate a large atomic models of these disorder structures and we can do percolation analysis to quantify how many lithium can percolate in this highway of lithium diffusion. So this is one example of this computational generated percolation map. So the color here, it basically tells you how many lithium can percolate in this disorder structure and X and Y are basically the compositional variables that you can control. So the first thing we did is just to uh, verify if this really makes sense, right? So we designed several groups of uh, experimental samples. Here are sample four to one at different composition. And we make them into batteries and we cycle them to measure the capacity. And we see that from prediction, sample four to sample one should have a monotonically increased amount of extractable lithium. In the experiment, we indeed see that the initial capacity goes up monotonically, which agrees well with the simulation. On the other hand, if you go from the other composition high line, so we, from sample six, uh, sample four to sample six, we're gonna minimize the extractable amount of lithium. Usually we do that for other purposes. And in this case, we also get a confirmation from experiment that sample six indeed gave you the least, you know, percolating amount of lithium. So with this kind of verification, now we are confident about our model. So the next thing we want to do, hopefully, is the good part, right? So we can scale it up very easily. So here are four promising systems that we're looking at, all made of uh, cheap metals. They are nickel compound, they are manganese compound with titanium and niobium as charge compositors. And all of these color maps is kind of interesting because they have 
similar kind of evolution going on here. So let me just take one of them and zoom in at a fixed lithium content, which is a fixed X value with different Y value, which is the foreign concentration as per formula unit. We see that in all four, uh, all four systems, first of all, we have most of this percolating amount of lithium below random limit. Secondly, it first goes down and then goes up until it hits the random limit. So apparently if you need good performance, what you need is to go to high foreignation, right? We tried this actually for quite a long time, which unfortunately doesn't really work so well because if you are working ever on any kind of oxyfluoride, doping fluorine into an oxide is very difficult. However, it's kind of a by accident, we realized there's a shortcut here. You know, we are trying to approximate random limit. So in other words, what we need to do is actually to make a material that is randomized enough. So the shortcut is essentially that we can put more metals into the lattices. And the idea that behind it is like when we have more metals, we are diluting the dominated concentration of certain metals. And in that case, we're diluting the dominated power interactions. So power probability is actually the short range order origin. So in that case, we can weaken this short range order, which seems to be detrimental to lithium diffusion. So driven by this idea, we did high throughput uh, phase stability calculations of these cathode materials. We screened the periodic table, ending up with like 7,965 of these promising cathode materials. And before I show you uh, this computational data, let me just quickly show you a proof of concept from experiments. So we pick up a few materials. Those are the concentration, uh, the composition of these materials we selected. So the first thing we want to verify is that we indeed get a more random material, right? So naturally we can do electron diffraction. So two transition metal give you very significant short range order features. Four transition metal, you can barely see them. For six transition metal, they almost disappear. There is only in diffract uh, a peaks of, uh, which is actually from the long range order. So this kind of a confirm high entropy means more random. However, we don't know about the performance, right? So we make those battery materials in, uh, into, uh, uh, into cathode and cycle them. So indeed, for six transition metal, we get uh, good initial capacities. And we later want to confirm this is indeed a lithium diffusion because in, in, the, in the field of battery, sometimes you get good capacity because of other reasons. So one way to test the lithium diffusion is to cycle this battery at different current rates. So we're basically charging or discharge this battery with different speed. So in that case, for two transition metal, what happened is like, if you go with a high current rate, the capacity decays very quickly into 50 milliamp hour per gram. But if you have the high entropy materials, it's gonna sustain about 180 milliamp hour per, per gram of capacity, which I kind of highlight here, because if you're driving a Tesla, so this is the capacity you are enjoying right now, but our materials have minimized amount of cobalt and we have all the other elements be much cheaper compared with cobalt. And most importantly, this kind of a current rate means you charge less than 10 minutes to reach the same capacity as a commercialized battery in an electric vehicle. So in that case, we are ending up with a solution you know, with more elements, but most of them are actually cheaper and more sustainable element compared with the state of art elements. And also with this kind of a high dimensional uh, compositional space, it's like a nine element compositional space. We can still use our class expansion model to capture the energetics as well as the evolution of chemical short range order and also the leasing population. So this is how do we, you know, tailor the design of these cathode materials. So again, let's just go back to the data. So this is basically a heat map of the metal compatibility of all these uh, 7,965 uh, high entropy materials we just computed. And it's also kind of interesting that most of these high entropy materials have much lower free random limits compared with lower uh, entropy materials. So that basically rings the bell, you know, whatever composition you develop, in general, they're gonna offer you reasonable and sometimes even exceptional properties compared with this low entropy counterpart. So this rings the bell that such materials does not 
relies on any heroes of models, it can basically work as long as you have a reasonable redox center and some reasonable composition of uh, elements. So this basically comes to the end of my first story. We, we kind of uh, found the reason why we need to care about high entropy in cathode materials. And the reason for that to summarize it in one sentence is because high entropy kills those bad short range order. In that case, it facilitated this simplification and is so far from all discovery only work for this new generation of cathode materials, which is called the solar rock salt materials. However, as you probably realize, you know, battery is not just about cathode, right? So our heaven is to use lithium metal as anode. So there is no point to do high entropy in anode. And we also need an electrolyte and very hopefully solid state electrolyte, right? Because it's just a safer and inflammable. So in that case, the second question I'm trying to answer is like, can we really make also a high entropy electrolyte? Can we get rid of this hero element? Of critical metals in electrolyte materials as well. So this is actually really a hard question because we have a very different structures. We have a variety of structures and materials as choice. So we need to find the generic principles for that. So before I jump into examples of material, let me tell you actually the pros and cons of disorder materials in terms of diffusion. So it's actually not always a good thing for going high entropy. So the energy landscape of diffusion of aqueous metals in the disorder materials that can actually sometimes be bad for diffusion because what you are seeing here is like a randomized fluctuation of energy landscapes. So that means sometimes your lithium or other aqueous metals can be trapped in this local minimum, and all the state of surrounding it is going to be in high energy and it's going to be basically that lithium. So this is definitely a bad situation. And essentially, if you take a look at how conductivity is calculated, it basically clears the carrier concentration. This is actually a bad thing. However, there is a way to turn this around. What we can do here is actually disorder also create a diverse collection of local environments. So sometimes diffusion can be promoted because it's actually not the average property. As long as we can find a low energy diffusion channels that are percolating, we can actually lower down the effective activation barrier. And the keep in mind, the activation barrier actually goes exponentially, which can, you know, which can easily like suppress the compressive conductivity, which goes linearly with the number of accessible sites. So this is basically a trade-off game and our winning point is like we have a term that we can minimize which goes exponentially. So as inspired by this kind of a hypothesis, then we, we just want to think about how can we design this diffusion process in a crystal lattice. So before that, let me just show you what is the composition of diffusion barrier. Like assuming that we have an atom diffusion from site one to site two, the so active, active, activation barrier is actually coming from two sides. So the first one is actually the side energy differences of these two uh, states. Well, the second one is more like an intrinsic activation barrier, which dictates the energy state of the saddle points. Okay, so naturally, if you have an ordered structure, so we have a well-defined site one and site two, right? They have the same local environment. So hopefully you have a one fixed constant of the side energy difference. However, when you have a disordered materials, so the neighboring outcomes can be any situations, right? So there will be a, a, a variety of options. So in that case, you're gonna have a distribution of the side energy. And in that case, it's possible that even in two distinct Wyckoff positions, you're gonna have an overlap of energy state. So this is actually the game changer here. So let me just go one step forward here. So in order the structure, we can have fixed side energy differences. And if this side energy difference is too large, unfortunately we have bad diffusion, right? But in these sort of structures, we can, as long as we can create this overlap, those will be these free carriers that can diffuse with very low side energy differences among the neighboring sites. And as long as those sites can percolate in a network, you can have high ionic conductivity. So this is basically a more uh, detailed picture of our 
uh, hypothesis in the very beginning, we can lower down the activation barrier by losing some of these carrier concentrations. And then let's just put that into a real material. Okay, so here we took uh, one material that we studied. We did a lot of high throughput screening in a uh, NERSC. And uh, this material is called Nasicon, and we have two crystalline sites, which is called a 6B site and 18E site. And it's originally coming from a sodium compound for sodium ion batteries. And uh, naturally in this material, if it's an older form, you have a fixed site energy differences. Let's take a sodium zirconium phosphate as an example. This is a very classic composition of this material, and it's a terrible ionic conductor. So if you do DFT calculations, you will realize there will be a huge side energy differences of 0.85 EV. So if you need a good ionic conductor, this value should be lower than 0.4, 0.3 EV. So this is a terrible conductor. However, if you create some distortion, so here we use distortion as the most important factors for disordering. The distortion gonna distribute the side energies and making the side energy distribution of these two sides overlapping with each other. So in that case, it's possible that you can have neighborly side having the same energy. So we did quantify this by calculating the percolating amount of lithium as diff at the different side energy differences. So the X axis tells you the maximum neighboring site. So for instance, like, if you have 0 0.14, basically tells you the we are calculating the amount of lithium can percolating with activation barrier less than 0 0.14 electron volt. So in that case, if you have an undistorted structure, which is the older structure, nothing will be percolating and there will be an abrupt trench until you reach 0 0.85, which is the side energy differences, right? So there will be basically a step function. However, if you have a distorted structure, which is actually the solid line, you already gonna have 22% of the sodium percolating at a very low energy differences, which is 0 0.14 electron volt. And some intermediate point like point D here, we already have 50% of uh, sodium percolating with uh, side energy differences smaller or equal to 0 0.5 electron volt, which a lot, of this, uh, a lot of sodium here is actually activated with low activation barrier. So then we're trying to extend this to a more generic picture. We tried a bunch of other materials like lithium version, lithium nasicon, lithium garnet, which is a commercialized electrolyte crystal structures. We see kind of the same uh, phenomenon that distortion gonna promote uh, diffusions of lithium regardless of structures. The only thing that difference is like the threshold, the number of percolating amount of lithium are different. And in that case, it's kind of confirmed this is actually a generic effect that disorder can promote the percolation of agar metals. So now we kind of have a more or less complete theoretic predictions. And then we move to the experimental side, trying to verify it. So um, we synthesize three types of high entropy materials. And the reason that we do high entropy here is because we can use entropy to stabilize large bond distortion. Otherwise, if you have a two distinct atoms, it will be very difficult to put them into the same crystal structure in the low entropy form. So this is a point of high entropy here. So we synthesize those three materials. They have very reasonable ionic conductivity. But what more interesting here is that all those low entropy counterpart here actually have orders of magnitude low ionic con conductivity compared with the high entropy version, which means this is not a you know, this is essentially not a cocktail effect. It's not a linear combination of this low entropy counterpart, but actually some synergistic effect is happening, which push up the ionic conductivity. We also did some uh, compositions from XRD and neutral diffractions, just trying to get some evidences of this disordering tendency going on here. So uh, what I, I put on the left column is actually the high entropy materials and the numbers in the bracket tells you, you know, how many occupancies we see in this uh, crystalline site of these materials. So if you'll see both of them being non-zero means like it starts to get disordered. And we also kind of compile this with the low entropy counterpart, which, you know, for all the cases, lithium and sodium gonna stay in the lowest energy site, which is also a sign of ordering. So this kind of a conversation also confirm, you know, this is essentially disordering that controls 
in the ionic diffusion. Okay, so on base of this idea, now we're trying to push limits to see how far we can go, right? So we just try all the good things in a good material, just make it high entropy to see like how, how good the ionic conductivity can be. So we are still on the process you know, of trying and pushing the limit, but I, I'd like to show you some of our results, which will be online uh, December 23rd. And so this is one of the sample we made, which is pretty high entropy with six transition metals. And we see a 3.3 millisiemens per centimeter of bulk conductivity, which is actually comparable with one of the best conductors, uh, uh, particularly oxide conductor, which is uh, commercialized in the market already. And also we just made a bunch of these high entropy materials and it's, we are happy to see that most of these materials can behave reasonably. All those five compounds that I show here, just look some random compositions. They all have ionic conductivity larger than one millisiemens per centimeter, which means high entropy can be actually a generic mechanism to boost ionic conductivity. So in the end, I'd like to acknowledge you know, a NERSC, which make all these things happen. We did a lot of high super screening calculations thanks to this world leading computing uh, uh, infrastructures. And I'd like to acknowledge uh, the most of this work is actually done by um, uh, my postdoc period with uh, advice from Professor Gert Cedar and also uh, Dr. Zhen Ren and Dr. Yan Zhen are the experimentalists um, uh, working on synthesizing this compound and doing all those kind of calculations. And we would like to thank this uh, funding agencies which support the discovery of uh, these high entropy materials. Uh, in the very end, I also would like to ad advertise a little bit. We have a new as uh, established research group uh, since this August. Uh, we already have like three members and two post are gonna join us very soon. And uh, we're happy to see that uh, Samsung decided to fund us on these high entropy battery materials immediately after I established. I'm very excited and I, I, I hope that we can find the new uh, uh, interesting discoveries on, on, on base of this topic. So that's pretty much about my presentation. I really appreciate uh, your attentions. Uh, I'm opening to questions. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Maybe we have time for maybe one quick question or so if anybody has one. Um, I'll ask one, I'll ask then one quick question about the materials. Um, so uh, it, was, it was really interesting, the ideas you put forth. Is, is it, are there any um, differences in stability of the materials or does that have any implications for, for safety? Um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's a very excellent question. So in, in, in terms of stability, I mean, in, in battery field, we, we, we care about two types of stabilities. Well, the first one is the phase stability. It's like basically whether we can make it. So in this case, high entropy material have advantage because uh, we typically synthesize these materials in high temperature. This is when entropy can stabilize those uh, multi-component materials. So they are fairly stable actually in a lot of situations. The second one is electrochemical stability. It's, it's basically different uh, component of a battery. Will they re react with each other or not? So in this case, high entropy materials will not be different. So it's kind of a depending on your crystal structures and your chemistry. So what happens in low entropy will also happen in high entropy materials. So that's basically my comment on, on stability of such materials. Okay, thank you. I also really enjoyed your slide that showed the workflow and the complicated workflow. Um, perhaps we'd like to talk to you more about that later because we're we're thinking a lot about how to optimize various workflows. Was were all those um, arrows and boxes and things performed at NERSC or were they um, some of the offsite? Uh, uh, I think partially they are performed on NERSC, and uh, we we are actually planning on um, a, a materials project is eventually generating on NERSC, and we are planning to move that to materials project so that we can do high super generation of these uh, class expansion models. So uh, we're, we're actually working on that. So we, we are kind of a developing code in the past few years, and now we're trying to launch this automation online in NERSC, hopefully. Okay, okay great. Thank you.